You're listening to the Work Cultured Podcast, where good companies keep good company. You're listening to the Work Cultured Podcast, or watching if you're on YouTube. And uh, today we have a uh, guest, Howard Baker of Central, no, Greater Texas Credit Union. Right, Greater Texas <laughs> I said, Credit I almost Union. said Central Texas Credit Union. Greater Texas Credit Union. But you also have another part of the business that's got a, a, an Aggieland nickname, yeah? Yes, Aggieland Credit Union in the Brazos Valley. So Bryan oh, nice. College Station. Yeah, yeah. For, for the listeners who are not Aggies, uh, that's uh, Bryan College Station, Texas a and and uh, I assume you went to school there, at least for a bit. I did. Yes, I yeah. did for a bit. Yeah. You're the third Aggie, by the way, as a guest on the podcast. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. So it's, it's a popular thing here in Austin, uh, nonetheless, right? <laughs> Go figure. Yep. I guess we get a lot of escapees and make yeah, it escapees. over here. I love that. But you were born and raised in Austin. I was. Uh, so kind of a unicorn. Uh, that's right. That's right. I didn't even know that term until uh, about 10 years ago, but... <laughs> it seems like no one is from Austin anymore. Yeah. Yeah, we're all transplants. Well, for the better. Yep. Well, give me a little bit more background on you. You've been in this role about seven years. Right. Correct? Okay. So how, how'd you end up getting into that? And yeah, give, give me the highlights of the journey. Well, you think about the, the, all the paths that one can take, but uh, really, it, I would uh, chalk it up to being uh, working hard, um, probably too hard sometimes. <laughs> and uh, a lot of God's blessings. But I uh, finished with a finance degree. I graduated from Texas State okay, and uh, went to work for the regulator for credit unions. And after about 14 years of that, I got job offers. I went to work for a credit union and uh, became chief of staff there. I was there for uh, 15 years, 13 of it as chief of staff. And this opportunity happened and I said, yeah, yeah. I, I think this is, this is something I want to do. And before that, I saw you were uh, ahead of risk, correct? Right. Okay. I was chief risk officer. Is that is that kind of your hard wiring is to be able to assess risk and, and mitigate? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're in the business of managing risk. Yeah. You know, our our, our margins in a uh, bank or a credit union are really, really thin. Mm. So it's about uh, getting the right risk return trade offs, understanding where the risk exists, trying to understand where you don't understand those risk returns. But uh, yes, that's that's my nature. Yeah. You know, I can't uh, can't say we do that perfectly all the time. Sure. But that is that is kind of how I'm hardwired yeah. to managing risk. And so to go from that into a president CEO role um, had to have been a little bit different. Uh, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> right. Well, you, the years that I wasn't chief risk officer, I was chief of staff. And that was about 12 or 13 years. Okay. And uh, I, I had the benefit of being around some really smart people, very seasoned. We had uh, an executive team that was... Uh, in age anywhere from 35 to 65 a lot of experience and i learned a lot from those folks yeah. they were they were really good at their jobs they're really good people and uh, i had a lot of great exposure and being chief of staff i i got to i got to be in on just about everything you're kind of the head of most things already somewhat <laughs> yeah somewhat. it's a it's a unique role that's for yeah. sure what, what's an aspect of the business that you're looking after now that you didn't have to look at after as the chief of, chief of staff yeah. Well, and uh, it, that's a great question. Some of those things I took for granted at places I worked before. Uh, one of those is technology, although technology, that uh, that's a bar that's moving quickly. Yeah. Right. And it's hard to keep up. It's hard to stay uh, modern and current to anticipate what uh, what members want, what they need, what they're going to want. Because uh, folks outside of financial institutions are providing financial services. Now they set that standard. I'd say one of those is technology. One of the things I didn't have a lot of exposure to was was the the management of of the work environment and okay. people. I came from a place I've came from two places where that was really done very well, and maybe I took that for granted a little bit. But it's even harder now, especially post pandemic. You're you're sure. seeing a changeover in the composition of the workforce, moving away from old baby boomers such as myself to those next generations, and uh, I think that is as a that kind of adds to that challenge. Right? Yeah. So like, you know, the word culture is, is kind of come to the human consciousness in the last maybe 10 years. I mean, it, 
work environment, people has always been part of business, obviously, but this, this really high focus on culture is relatively new in the whole landscape of industrial level revolution to now. Uh, was that at the top of your mind at all when you first started as CEO or did that have to kind of come hit you a little bit? <laughs> Absolutely. It was near top of mind. Yeah. It's certainly top of mind now. And one of the reasons that I believe that all businesses and organizations are paying attention to that is, is this changeover from generations. Uh, my generation was one. It's my perception, at least. We care an awful lot about work, probably mm -hmm. too much about work, mm -hmm. too much about achieving it uh, in the office. And sometimes our work-life balance got out of whack. I still deal with that. Personally, I still deal with it, yeah. right? New generations, they have a, a better concept of what work-life balance should be. And sometimes that runs afoul of some of their career goals, but that's, that's <laughs> yeah. the you're, right. It's a trade -off. You know, so, and it is a trade off, but the, that's, that's kind of the one of the reasons why culture is maybe more important now than what it was ever before a baby boomer. We were all kind of the same in many ways, right? Mm -hmm. hey, this is your job. Um, this is what you accepted. So we need to get up there and do that. Yeah. And yeah. you know, guys like me, when I needed that push, I didn't take offense to that. I go, mm, I'm kind of embarrassed. Right. I should have been doing my job a little yeah. bit better than that. I knew what I was supposed to do. I needed to do it. I'll yeah. do it better. Exactly. Yeah. That's that. Right. But it's not that way now. But it was a little easier mm -hmm. when it was a bunch of folks that were in the baby boomer uh, range. Also, too, though, the post-pandemic world is a very different one. And uh, the expectations about work and life balance shifted yeah. during that time. And I got to admit, put me in that category. I mean, yeah. when the times when when uh, governments and municipalities said, hey, you need to stay at home, you need to close those offices down, it was certainly nerve-wracking for me. We're <laughs> running a business here. We had Absolutely. projects ongoing, which yeah. I'm so proud of us. We still delivered upon. But we we moved, and mm -hmm. it was very, uh, for, for me during that time, I kind of liked rolling out of bed, brushing my teeth, and yeah. going down to the computer and getting my work done. We had honestly not enough interaction but that became a, a really kind of comfortable thing my wife would say hey, let's go walk and we go walk at lunch that's kind of cool yeah and so the transition back has been made by many workers and sometimes it hasn't but a concept of work like balance in my mind shifted yeah post pandemic and you know you see a lot of employers now want all these want their folks back at work and I understand yeah, why totally Co collaboration is very difficult in a zoom call mm -hmm. Like yeah. you and I are having a great conversation. There's an ebb and flow to yep. it. It's There's harder with the delay flow. of the internet delay and right. the, the the something about just the energy of humans being in the same room. Yeah, right. Uh, is very powerful. Um, but yeah, the, the stay at home shifted the landscape big time. Right. The Zoom call doesn't really allow for that. So collaboration is hard. That's why folks. That's why employers. Yeah. Big tech. They want want those people back in the office. Yep. But we're we're not going to do that. I. Hmm. It's. Uh, well, it's up to managers and supervisors, but I like being at home too sometimes. And I think you know, every employee does. So yeah. to the extent that their job can accommodate that, I mean, I'm all for that. That's, That's awesome. That's a new expectation. Yeah. So I'm in that uh, micro generation that they call Xennials. So like born in 1980. So it's between Gen X and millennial. And the Gen Xers kind of had the the boomer mentality, but I just go to work and work and don't complain about it. Uh, you know, work and life are completely separate you know, millennials obviously are a lot more focused on that work-life balance. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I've experienced that shift of just, well, I'm working, I'm grinding, I'm hustling. And then all of a sudden kind of wake up one day, I'm like, Oh, like life's also very important. And then, you know, that was only probably a few years before the pandemic for me to, to have almost a wake up call and then totally flipped on its head with work from home. And right. Uh, of course I sold my company that year too. That was uh, a big shocker, but, <laughs> uh, yeah. It's it's super interesting, and I'm I'm I find it interesting that you're not having folks come back, at least not you know, as a mandate, uh, in in the in the uh, in the office. Yeah, well, I know I valued it. Even now, my wife will ask, uh, "Are you, you working at home? <laughs> nope. You gonna work at home this week? Mm, can't do it. it." It became an expectation from the family too. I'm sure, and you know, my kids are grown, mm. working now, but I would I would imagine it's the same way it, it, from the rest of the family for folks who have a family in the house still. Yeah. Well, I promised you a, a first question. And of course, okay. I, I never get to it first. We always circle back around just because the intro has so many interesting questions. But the, the, the question we ask every guest is, what's uh, a, a mistake that you've made in leadership that you really feel like you learn from and you'll never forget? Right. right. Uh, 
Well, there's a lot of mistakes, right? Yeah. A lot most, of mistakes. Most, most people say, wait, just one? How, is that way? <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I would think back, uh, the one that was most uh, impactful on me, was actually embarrassing, made me feel, uh, you know, a little bit inadequate. Uh, when I um, when I first was promoted to chief of staff, where I used to work, I I uh, I, I made this uh, um, made the wrong assumption. Everybody was kind of like me uh, when it came to getting things done, mm. the sense of urgency. And even though we were all from the same generation, uh, I I had that. It's still something that I that I fight against today. Right, I have to be aware that folks are not like me. And um, you know, now that I'm in the in a, in a work environment where I'm almost the oldest person there. I probably am the oldest person there. I'm the only <laughs> one left in my generation is even more pronounced. But I would say that first mistake really was that. And it took some 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 older folks that were in the management team to say, hey man, Howard, you you need to cool your jets on that. You know, wow. you're 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 going way too hard. And it, it was embarrassing, but um it was also really, really beneficial. And like I say, I have to constantly fight that. But it was a uh, it things kind of went better, um, and I realized that I I really have to I have to cool off too. Um, well, for a lot of reasons, for my own health. <laughs> but you know, you mess uh, you mess up a whole dynamic, a whole necessary dynamic when it comes to communication and trust. When yeah, you realize that um, you have to uh, think about how you appear to others. You have to change your perspective about what you're doing and how fast it can happen. Because you necessarily rely on everybody else. Yeah. And the older you get and the further along you get, if you get to sit in my chair one day, and so many people will, you're relying more and more on everybody. I'm less of a doer than I've ever been. I'm an allocator of resources, create environments, an encourager, maybe a cheerleader sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I'm now relying on people, and it's even more important for me to realize uh, things aren't going to get done exactly at the pace I think it should. Maybe that um, I would like it to see. It's yeah. got to happen at its own, at a pace that's tolerable. But it starts with making sure that I know not everybody is not not everybody's like you. me. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm right. I'm not saying that's good to be like me. They're just different. Sure, you know, they're, you those have your own expectations are, because of how you're wired and what you, how you've done things. And somebody actually might be doing it better, but if it's different, it doesn't feel quite right at first. Right. Yeah. Again, my generation was, "Yep, yeah, boy, you did that wrong. You need to go out there and do that again." <laughs> Yep, you're right. I didn't. Yes, sir. <laughs> you know, that's my generation. Well, the, uh, to me, that's the most impressionable. There's plenty of others. Sure. But, but that one, one is I big. constantly fight. Yeah, that one is big because it's one of those things that once you know it, you kind of go, how did I not? You said you were embarrassed I mean, because how did you not realize how differently all people are wired? Right. It, it, but I, I had that same moment. And it actually took, um, I, we started, impl we implemented a psychometric behavioral assessment for our hiring practices. And then we actually brought it into like our leadership team. And so I had this kind of like data backed science backed personality profile of me and my CEO who I butt heads with turns out we were opposite, <laughs> but now I was starting to get language of like, Oh, these are actually like my hard wiring. These are my, my motivating drivers that are internal that have been set since I was you know, a preteen mm -hmm. and him too. And, and so like, of course we're not going to see eye to eye, but wow, we can really compliment each other here. We can really kind of be a, you know, almost a yin yang kind of a thing going on. Uh, and then, I mean, again, like once I had that language, that knowledge, I was like, how did I not realize that? Right. Yeah. All right. Ooh, Recognizing you, those differences, you can leverage those. Oh yeah. You probably were pretty effective together. We, we, we became differences. that way. Yeah. Yeah. Embraced After them. butting head for a, for a long time, all of a sudden we were a two headed monster. And mm -hmm. I, I think we, very much conquered that industry. <laughs> uh, so would you agree then with the idiom where uh, people say that all business problems are people problems? Um, well, there's so many external. I would say you're not going to really resolve things without addressing people problems. And there was always yeah. going to be people problems. It's probably the biggest challenge we have. I don't know if they're all because you just think about our operating environment today for a financial institution. You got rising interest rates. You got sure. macroeconomic things that are imposed upon us. You have for us, you know, a financial institution might as well be a nuclear power plant. We are so <laughs> regulated. But at the end of the day, the the people problems are the biggest one. And yeah, I won't call them problems. They are 
Challenges. It's not a problem. Frictions. Bad, you know, yeah. You, you know, it's a, a, a people are not an asset like a computer or a truck or a right. building or a computer system or software, right? They're not, they're living, being, feeling. Yeah. Uh, emotional well, beat. Yeah entities right we're, we're real choosy about how who we have on the podcast and so many of our guests have we're, we're choosy in that we want people that have built good culture right if somebody has a terrible culture, i don't really want to hear about how you built a terrible culture right so like there's a reason you're here and you're one of so many people that take that word asset and just uh, kind of dog on it as well it should be because language matters and if we're calling humans assets we're kind of missing a lot more nuance about who humans are who people are uh, and I right. love that you you said that because right. so many others have. Yeah, yeah. In a command and control structure where those folks are people are viewed as interchangeable, that's where they're be, that's where they're pushed towards that asset category rather than yep. necessary emotional drivers of, of business. Yeah, I mean it was it was the one thing that turned around the company I was with prior. It, it, they were every person was an asset, and you hired them as cheap as you could, you treated them like crap, and you fired them when you needed to move on. And that was the entire industry. It was very blue collar, most of the uh, workforce. Uh, and so our leadership team said, what if we just started you know, valuing humans? <laughs> what, what if that was the differentiator? And we tripled in size in eight years after oh. 34 years of Plateau. It was wow. amazing, yeah. So and of course, a cultural shift. Then big time, of that. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, technology, of course, had to help with that much scale in that short of amount of time. Yeah, it was people. That was it. <laughs> Which is why I'm so passionate about it and you know, hosting a podcast, et cetera. <laughs> well, when you think about it too, I mean, that culture is important. I, and I say this a lot, and I know people have heard probably if you know me I've heard me say this before, but that gummit, this is where you spend most of your life, right? Yep. You're gonna be with your family or your significant other a good bit of the time but you're at least eight hours doing this. Now, yeah. you sometimes you get to do it in your garage or your, or your home office now compared mm -hmm. to before the pandemic. But this has to be something that's uh, yeah, in, engaging and uh, that you find important yeah. and um, that you've bought into yeah. to some extent or maybe a large extent. But this is a big part of your life. And so if it's something that uh, is, is stressful and it's necessarily stressful anyway, you can't get away from that. But this has to be an environment that recognizes this is life mm -hmm. You're spending more time doing this than you are just about anything, anything else. else yeah i love that with the the people environment the culture uh at, at your company what, what's something that you feel like you're most proud of well i most proud of in my culture i think that people generally care about each other there right there is a lot of there's a lot of respect mm. and um you know we're asking our folks to do things uh, that they've not done before we're asking them to uh, to recognize what it takes in our business and to embrace those things you start with focus on the member you know but our, our folks have really really done well and we've gotten a lot of traction in the last three years and it, i guess despite the fact that we have many of them who drive some of these things are are not on the front line mm. they're at home in their garages during the pandemic right so i would say i'm very proud of what we achieved during that time and i think it's it says something about the about the core values of, of our group yeah uh, but they are dedicated they got a lot of integrity but a compassion for one another i love that yeah, yeah. It's i'm very proud of our our organization that is really cool What's, uh, what's one of the core values that you also just really love? Well, I mentioned compassion. I would, I would say that one uh, okay. for me. And uh, that one is, uh, you know, we talked about what my greatest, <laughs> that's not ironic, what my greatest <laughs> mistake was, the one that I remember the most. And, uh, you know, when, when you lack that, th this awareness and compassion for others, you're just thinking about the task at hand, or you're thinking yeah. about yourself sometimes, quite honestly. Hard to admit, but that's true. Uh, that that compassion is an important thing, and that these core values that we have, that, that compassion being one of them, is developed by employees. Mm. We didn't we didn't really have core values until about six years ago, and it was a group, a cross section of employees that that ad identified that as one of our 
our core values. But to me, it rings, you know, it's, to me, it's, it's compassion, compassion at work, compassion for, for what you do for the members. Certainly. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is our business yep. it exists for members and their benefit, but compassion for the community you know, all these things. And I'm, and I'm also proud of that. I'm proud of, yeah. of how our employees have really stepped up in, in volunteering and, and showing in the community what, what our organization is all about. Yeah. Awesome. It, the flip side, uh, challenges are, are just areas of growth, whether you have them now or you foresee them potentially coming on the horizon, what, what are some challenges that, that you're feeling or anticipating? Challenges in the way of uh, the culture? Yeah. Culturally, I, I, you know, right now, it, it, for us, you know, uh, financial institutions have what's a, called a core banking system. It's the, it's the system of all the deposits and loans and all the activities that members do and uh, all these, uh, such as digital banking platforms hook mm -hmm. up to it. All these, all these services and uh, interactions and marketing systems all hook up to this, this core banking system. And they usually have a shelf life for like 20 years. We've been in ours since about 1989. <laughs> We're undergoing this core banking project with only 225 employees, it's extremely disruptive. Yeah. And we've uh, enlisted our best people to work on the core banking project. There's about 65 people who dedicate time to this. At the same time, we're trying to encourage these folks to still take care of their business, farm that out to others. So it's very, very stressful. I see that, uh, I see, uh, you know, a burnout on those uh, as, as a, as a risk for us at this yeah. point. And, uh, we're almost done with that core banking project. Okay. We're almost done. We were just months away, but I see that as on the horizon, you know, sometimes, and I am just like this. I, I, I long for that day where I get a day where I take care of the papers that are on this side of the desk or this side of the email now, and they go on that side of the email and they're done where I don't have a lot of interaction. We're not having those times right now. So I see that as a, as a risk for us yeah. over the next uh, next five or six months. But moving forward, I, I think it's this constant string of projects. Fortunately, none of them will be like it is now. So every this project that you do after this one is going to be much smaller in scope out. and much easier, <laughs> right? But uh, when we talk about technology and whatever business it is, whether it be um, the way we discuss things like we're discussing now via a podcast, Without this technology, it would not nearly be as effective. It wouldn't be as accessible. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be as, uh, as effective. And in financial services, people expect um, their provider to keep up with the best providers, whether that be Everybody a, wants to download the best app. Yes. To have best notifications, the cleanest UI, you know, yeah. Wow, you're it's, right. It's, it's a they heavy They do load. care about <laughs> notifications a lot. Yeah. And they don't necessarily care that they need to tell us what they are we should anticipate that mm -hmm. so these projects will always continue and you know, the the pace of those projects really has to be tempered especially here in the short run as we finish this core banking project yeah so um i see that on the horizon and there's got to be some reassurance that we do about mm -hmm. the pace being tempered and uh communicating the scope of those before we get into them yeah and setting some expectation expectations I, about sen that. I sense this huge like uh, kind of conflict within you specifically as as a leader and what you might be experiencing because you're a risk guy but mm -hmm. you're also get it done yesterday guy you're <laughs> an older generation you're embracing technology you're, there's all these kinds of things that are like almost fighting at each other right. you want to do it you want to do it now you want to do it have it done yesterday but you also need to you need to slow the pace at the same time because technology is innovation innovation inherently has risk right uh so yeah tell me the What's going on in your head and heart through all that? <laughs> Man, you've got it. Now, I will tell you, when it comes to getting it done yesterday, that's that's kind of, I'm very much past that. Okay. Okay, so these things can happen. Well, I say that, maybe my <laughs> actions are different. <laughs> that, uh, But that is where my heart is when it comes to yeah. the pace of these changes. There is some business urgency there, right? Yeah. Financial services is a really, it's highly fractured. So there are few people that stay at one provider anymore. You might have, like I do, I have several credit cards in my wallet. One of them's ours, of course, but there's other, yeah. other credit cards in there. 
my mortgage is um, from another credit union. My mm-hmm. home equity loan is at this credit union. Mm-hmm. I get my car loans here. Uh, checking account. Yeah, but no one really is any, it, it's very fractured. You get to see what other providers do. It's highly competitive. Yeah. In pretty much everything we have is a commodity, right? So it's about competing well. It's about delivering on on members and, and, and potential new members' expectations. It's about efficiencies. At the end of the day, it's about economies of scale because everything we got is a commodity, has a margin of like that, mm-hmm. very, very small margins. So there's a sense of urgency there that says, yeah, we want to get this done yesterday. Same time that we can only move it as, as, as quickly as we can. So that's kind of what goes on in my head. Yeah. I, will, I will err to the, to the side of uh, making sure that the pace is right for our organization. Yeah. Things that we can actually do without running ourselves into the ground as people and our business into the ground. Mm-hmm. What what is your leadership team like? Are your kind of top executive team? How many people are on that? There are um, seven or eight, and they range from an employee who's been here 25, 30 years to a member of my team, been here a year. Okay. Yeah, so it's a really nice mix. You've got a lot of institutional knowledge. Yeah. um, Are they all kind of overseeing like departments, so you know, so you've got somebody on the technology, obviously you have HR and, and ops, but um, do you feel like they're playing multiple roles and, and driving vision, values, culture as, as much as you, or do you think that that's more segmented? Well, that's, I think that's moving in the right direction. Uh, when it comes to uh, driving uh, values, I think everybody has those. When it comes to making that though part of the culture, that's a it's a work in progress. That yeah. probably always will be right. Mm. Uh, when you have uh, multiple and shifting priorities, sometimes you have new team members coming on, others leaving. Uh, culture can be impacted by a set of impressions that turn into a um, re- real or not turn in reality. You know, yeah. impressions are one person's reality. But I, I see this team uh, moving in the right direction together on a lot of stuff. Operationally, sometimes we're siloed. Mm. but who what organization isn't sure. I, I think many will be kidding themselves if they say yeah we're not very solid we probably yeah. are at a time though where we have this core banking project and things like that sometimes just getting the work done keeps you in your silo that mm-hmm. uh, you know we, we often you think about how much time do i think doing doing the work do, do i do work instead of thinking you know those ratios get out of whack for my team sometimes so in 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 the sense that you want them to do more of thinking, like take a step back from things or, or they do too much thinking? Uh, no, do more time thinking, yeah. more time being strategic, more time thinking about us as a provider, yeah. uh, where we fit in the marketplace. Um, that's usually about where, winning. That's usually where the imbalance is, is right. you just put your head down and to try to climb back up to 20,000 feet and take a look at things from a high level can be really hard. Right. And your your inclination, inclination is to, you know, help get it done. Yep. You got to be careful with that, though, too. Yeah, I think it's a really important call out for from, from you as leader to other leaders as well, that you have to get your team out of the weeds. Sometimes you have to encourage them to take that time to think, to strategize, because right. um, that also can't be necessarily all that easy for you to encourage sometimes, because sometimes you just want to get the work done and you want it to be profitable and you want to watch that bottom line. Right. But you also know that if you take your eye off the prize, the five year, the 10 year you know, horizon, then you, you'll get stuck and left behind. I will tend to uh, leave them alone as much as possible because sometimes, sometimes I do need to put a shoulder to something. Mm-hmm. But um, it is it's it's a it's a balancing act. Yeah, that's for sure. If you were to ask almost any executive, except in the maybe the very largest companies, corporations, they're they're going to tell you the same thing. We I spend too much time on on daily work on operational things, being in the weeds, mm-hmm. as opposed to being strategic. Yeah. Thinking about the long term. Yeah. And how many branches do you have? We have 16. 16 branches. Wow. Right. And they're, they're spread out uh, throughout Texas. Yeah. You know, our field of membership was uh, Texas Department. It's Health and Human Services. And uh, those branches kind of followed where there were clusters of, of uh, employees. And, and over time, we've expanded the field of membership. But that's how we end up with branches in Dallas and Arlington. Sure. Yeah. All the way to Edinburgh. Yeah. Uh, down by McAllen. Oh, ah, okay. So yeah, we're geographically dispersed to, mm-hmm. to a, maybe a larger ex- 
stint than most crate units our size would be. That's interesting. That yeah. presents a challenge too. But yeah, 16 branches, yeah. 225 could you, employees. Could you talk about va values? And um, I, so I had, by the end of it, 24 branches, but all over the U.S. And getting culture to really, and values to permeate throughout the whole organization was always really challenging. Because just when I thought, you know, I'll visit a couple, I'm like, oh, things are really great. And then I'd you know, go to Philadelphia and I'd be like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that, we, and then, you know, if any of my ex employees, I'm, I, that was an example. I'm not calling you out in Philly, uh, but <laughs> uh, I, I'm curious if you have that same challenge sometimes, where just being a different branch can get siloed in, in, in itself, and things aren't permeating the way you want them to. Right. Yeah. I, absolutely true that the cultures will be slightly different in every one of these outlying locations. Fortunately for us, they're, they're positive cultures Good. in their own right. Might be slightly different, but necessarily they're going to have their own culture. Sure. They're, not, they're not in Austin mm -hmm. or College Station where we have our other large cluster of employees. They, uh, they're off on their own, but they're highly effective in serving members. They get good reviews. They take care of members well. They have a low turnover. All the things that you might look yeah. for that would be maybe a red flag. Mm-hmm. So that while their cultures are different, they're not they're not broken. Yeah, they're not a concern. Now, there I'm sure there are things that I don't know about culturally in some of those places, but I don't think that it's anything that rises no, no to big red flags level of concern. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Yeah, wow. that's that's true though, and it is a challenge. Mm -hmm. the, the cultural part, I think it's more about engagement sometimes, because when there's an out, a group in an outlying area, they're all, or, or are they there's a, a us and them kind of mentality that happens sure. a little bit. Do they know who you are? Or are you still like involved enough that they're like, Oh, it's, it's Howard you know, Mr. Uh, Baker I, or whatever. I like to think they do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I make an effort yeah. to, to visit, visit those places. Yeah. Cool. And That's uh, good. yeah, I, I feel like I know those folks. Right. Yeah. I, I, I like the idea that I go to Houston and on the, on Fridays they're wearing Astros gear. It's pretty cool. Nice. Yeah. So, it, that's an example, but yeah, yeah. I so I try to spend time in there. I didn't don't get to as much as I'd like to, mm -hmm. not but I've, I've made an effort like the to Astros, do it. But yeah. I'll still give True. you props. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, or it can be really hard. Depends on who you talk to, I guess. Uh, they can be a little divisive, but um, man, Howard, this has been a, such a fun conversation. I, you know, doing a time check, so we'll kind of go to the next segment. Sure. Um, which is really just plugs. Uh, you know, what do you want to plug? And obviously, I think you should. You know, give us the URL. Tell us about the credit union. I mean, I'll just say I'm about to be getting a loan through you guys because I have a uh, an auto lease that I mean, never before should it, should you buy a a lease, right? You don't buy your lease at the end of it, but right now it's crazy. Supply chain is crazy. I'm like, I guess I'm going to buy this car, <laughs> right? Right. But I'm going to buy it through a credit union, not through the you know Volvo Financial because they want to rip my head off. <laughs> I am glad to hear that. I, I, well, let's see the the plug the plug like. For, for our for our institution, yeah. Well, I'll, first of all, I'll tell you in in general, credit unions are are probably your best deal. Mm -hmm. You know, our our cooperative ownership structure we're not we're not owned by a, a family or a handful of shareholders. It's every member who has an account there has a say, has a vote. We're governed by a volunteer board of directors who really only exist to make sure members are getting uh, yeah. value that they're being cared for. But credit unions will do things that other financial institutions will not. Mm. And the cultures in credit unions are all very similar, right? Uh, for us, though, uh, you know, our, our goal is to give you a, a, a basket full of products and services that when considered together is a really high value. Sometimes some of the deals are not the best deals in the market. Sometimes they are. Mm -hmm. But I think what can define us is how well we take care of members, how well we take care of members when there's a struggle, how well we take care of members when we don't do something exactly right. Sure. I feel like we are really good at that. That's awesome. And um, we care to be good. You know, a lot of times when you get a complaint or a member is a little bit uh, ticked off at us, it points to something we need to pay attention to. Yeah. So uh, I, that's my plug is Love that uh, I think, Anything We're really not, focused on the member. Yeah, anything not work related, side projects you're working on, anything like that. Side projects, <laughs> you know. Sometimes we get some some fun things here, but you know, you never know. Uh, uh, 
it's like, man, this is going to show uh, my, my, my generation and uh, why, how I get things done yesterday. Sometimes I need more side projects. <laughs> uh, no, I, for me, sports, family. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm pretty boring. That's not boring. <laughs> I doubt that. So here's our last segment. It's a quick fire. I'm just going to say a this or a that, and you just tell me which one okay. comes to mind. This so, or that. Okay. Yep. So chocolate or vanilla. Chocolate. Google or Microsoft? Google. Okay. Country or city? Country. Football or soccer? Football. Playing or coaching? I wish I could play, but I'll go ahead and coach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Would that have been different in a different uh, time of your life? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah maybe so. I feel that. Uh, yeah. I, if, if you like sports, but you're just a below average athlete, I guess you have to go. Uh, <laughs> yeah. For me, I'd have to say coaching. That would be me. That's awesome. Well, that's just like our, our fun, silly way to end with some good energy. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much uh, for all of this insight uh, and just sharing your story. Well, thank you for having me. It's yeah. been very enjoyable. It's a fast hour. Great. Yeah. Well, uh, this has been the Work Culture Podcast, and we are signing off.